Tim, I'm 100% ready and excited. I am 100% ready and excited because it's time for another edition of our exciting television program from home. It's Sports Center with Jay and Dan. It's brought to you by our friends at McDonald's. And it is an absolute scorcher in the city of Toronto on Wednesday, Dan. And that means, in my opinion, it is perfect soccer weather. Sock weather? Yeah, sock weather, Dan. That's what I said. Sock weather. Soccer weather. Oh. <laughs> I thought maybe it was a tradition in your house in the summer. When the heat comes on, put on the socks. Uh, hey, um, the MLS, when I heard the return to play format, you know what? I think they have the best return to play out of all the professional sports. Because wait till you hear this. It is going to be called the MLS return to play tournament and you know why i'm excited because it's going to be like world cup all 26 clubs going to participate with every match taking place in orlando format very similar to world cup there's going to be a pre-tournament draw to assign groups a group stage followed by a knockout round how cool is this luke wildman has more finally for 2020 mls is back Here's everything you need to know about the MLS's back tournament, which kicks off July 8th at ESPN's Wide World of Sports. All 26 teams will be split into six groups, with three groups for each conference. Each club will play three group stage games, and they'll count towards the regular season. The top two teams from each group, along with the four best third place finishers, will move on to the knockout stage. We came up with this concept of a 54 uh, match tournament similar to the very successful World Cup here in 1994, where 24, only 24 nations competed. Knockout round matches that finish tied at the end of regulation play will proceed directly to penalty kicks. And the club that wins the tournament will be rewarded with a CONCACAF Champions League berth. The tournament will include a prize pool of $1.1 million. And very importantly, something that was just finalized this morning with the support of CONCACAF and U.S. Soccer and the Canadian Soccer Association. The winner of the tournament will earn a spot in the 2021 Scotiabank CONCACAF Champions League. Teams will begin to arrive in Orlando on June 24th. Players can opt out if they're granted an exemption due to medical or family conditions. There's no confirmed plan for what happens following the tournament, but the league is hopeful they can return to regular season play with games in home markets. Each MLS club played two regular season games before the league suspended play back on March the 12th. I'm very optimistic. I do believe we'll get back to our markets. I think all of our fans should expect that to happen. When that will happen is still uh, uh, uncertain. Uh, and whether or not we'll have any markets with fans is also uh, uncertain. The commissioner also said on Wednesday that without fans being permitted to attend matches, neither the Canadian or U.S. anthems will be played during the Orlando tournament. I'm joined by Christian Jack. And KJ, since news of this tournament started to break a few weeks ago, you have been adamant that it has to matter. They had to do something to make sure it just wasn't another tournament that these teams are playing in. So regular season points will be given for the group stage. The winner of the whole thing will get a place in the CONCACAF Champions League next year. Has MLS done enough for you? Yeah, I think they've done enough. I think it's a good compromise. Look, I think initially when the, when the announcement came out, there was more games being played down there. I think ideally that would have been a better scenario. And obviously players didn't want to be down there for longer and they needed to find a way to get a knockout stage competition here. So I think it's enough to get three regular season games counting towards regular season standings when obviously they return back to playing in their own markets after the tournament. And they have something to play for. They have a berth in the CONCACAF Champions League, which is significant, particularly for Canadian teams, a different route to get to that competition. So I think that's enough as well. And also the, the ability to try and win something, win a tournament and have that competitive drive, which sometimes is disappearing from Major League Soccer, particularly in the summer months. What shape are the three Canadian teams in heading to Orlando? Well, Toronto FC will be seeded in Thursday's draw. We know that because they reached the semi-finals last year. Obviously, they reached the final, but the four semi-finalists have been allowed to get seeded for that. So they'll be seeded. They'll be classed as one of the favourites for the tournament. 
but Bradley is back and fit. You know, obviously there's an opportunity for him to come in there and make a difference right away. We know what this team is like in tournament style football when the, when the lights get the brightest and things mean the most. They've proven over the last few years to be able to deliver. Montreal seemingly will be one of the favorites as well, I think, to try and do some damage in the Eastern Conference. I can only hope that they get put in the same group as Toronto FC. That would certainly be nice to have one of those games being played in that tournament, but they're coming off a decent Champions League run that was obviously halted. Victor Wanyama coming in to bolster that midfield with Samuel Piet, the Canadian midfielder. And the Whitecaps, you know, don't write them off either. You know, they're going to be a long shot to win the whole thing, but they came off a fantastic result the last time they played a competitive game, which will be four months ago by the time they kick off when they played a game in LA. But they're defensively have sorted this, they've, they've sorted out the defense a little bit, and they'll be organized and prepared for this tournament as well. So it's wide open, expect some madness, some crazy results. It's fun to have it back. And of course, these teams' success will depend on who they're drawn against in the group stage as well, and they will find out their schedules Thursday afternoon. Kenneth Heiner Muller is departing his role as Canada's women's national team head coach. Heiner Muller was hired in January 2018 and had an international record of 20 wins, 5 draws, 10 losses. In his time as head coach, Canada qualified for the 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup in the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. No replacement has been named as of yet. Well, Dan and I had a uh, very uh, fun social distancing uh, dinner that we had planned this evening, so we weren't able to finish all the stuff in the show. But, uh, Dan, I understand someone else is going to step in. That's right. We always have Kate Burness, professional, talented broadcaster, waiting to deliver any breaking news. And she's got some. Kate? All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. Well, at the beginning of the week, Bubba Wallace asked NASCAR to ban Confederate flags, saying no one should feel uncomfortable when they come to a race. Well, on Wednesday, NASCAR did just that, announcing the flag will no longer be allowed to be displayed at future events. A significant change. At a Wallace sporting a Black Lives Matter paint job in support of the fight against racial injustice. Athletes across the world of sports also weighing in. LeBron James and Richard Sherman sharing their support. Sherman added, I respect it. This has changed. This fan base isn't the most diverse or inclusive, and it takes a lot of courage to take this stand in this sport. Now, Wallace had a strong first stage, finishing fifth, narrowly avoids a collision on pit road, just missing Ryan Priest early in stage two. Wallace ended up finishing the race in 11th place. Now, during a caution in stage three, Austin Dillon, he's carried out of his car. An issue with his car causing extreme heat for Dillon. Now, this also the third Cup Series race within the last two weeks. Let's flash back to the 2018 fall race at Martinsville. Martin Truex Jr. and Joey Logano making contact right on the final lap, bumping off each other until they crossed the line. Truex Jr. would end up finishing in third place. Back to Wednesday's race we go. Truex Jr. only has one win here in 28 starts. Started this one in fifth, and he wins this race by over four seconds, his sixth straight season with a victory. And the NASCAR Cup Series is back on the track Sunday with the Dixie Vodka 400 at Homestead Miami Speedway. The race will have a 1,000 servicemen in attendance as guests for the race, the first event to have people in attendance since the pandemic began. Coverage begins at 3.30 Eastern. Well, speaking of the pandemic, it has affected nearly every league's draft this year, and Major League Baseball is no exception, cutting their rounds down from 40 to just five. On Wednesday night, the first 37 picks were selected with the Jays holding down the fifth overall pick. Here is the commissioner, Rob Manfred. With the fifth pick of the 2020 MLB draft, the Toronto Blue Jays select Austin Martin, a shortstop from Vanderbilt University. Well, a surprise at the draft on Wednesday with Austin Martin, the consensus number two pick, falling to the Blue Jays at number five. Martin started at least two games at six different defensive positions at Vanderbilt. No matter where he ends up defensively, he is projected to become a top-of-the-order major league hitter. He was announced at the draft as a shortstop, making it the third time in the last four years the Jays have taken a shortstop with their first pick. 
Joined now by our Jays reporter, Scott Mitchell. And Scott, you had Austin Martin being taken second overall to the Baltimore Orioles in your mock draft, but the Jays get him at number five. This seems like a dream scenario. So the question is, is how does he fit into this organization? Well, that's the thing. You mentioned it. And the way he fits is he fits in a number of ways, potentially both with the glove and with the bat. But the Blue Jays did not expect him to be there at number five. And just about nobody did. Everyone had this guy going in the top three. He plays for one of the best programs in the country at Vanderbilt, a team, a program that really just uh, spits out star after star. And this guy was really supposed to go to the Baltimore Orioles, a division rival of the Toronto Blue Jays. And now he's a Blue Jay. And the Blue Jays were absolutely elated to see him there, talking to Shane Farrell, the Blue Jays scouting director after the draft, shortly after he made the pick. They didn't have him being there for them, and they love it. They see this guy as a potential 300 hitter with 20 homer upside, and the best part is the uh, defensive versatility. He's played shortstop, he's played third, he's played second base. He can fit in center field as well, and that's where the Blue Jays may play him. They announced him as a shortstop. They're going to develop him as an infielder to try to keep that versatility, but the best part is this guy can land at whatever spot the Blue Jays have a need when he's ready for the big leagues in a couple years. The last time the Jays had to pick this high, 1997, when they selected Vernon Wells. A very exciting time to be a Jays fan. Thank you very much, our Scott Mitchell. I can already hear the Austin Martin, Austin Matthews mix-ups and highlight packs. Don't forget, we have coverage of rounds two through five of the MLB Draft Thursday night on TSN. Coverage begins 5 Eastern. We'll get you back to Jay and Dan next. Uh, NASCAR's in full swing. UFC's back. This week, we'll get the PGA back. We told you MLS is coming back soon, NHL, NBA. Dan, it seems everybody's coming back, except for the sport that could probably be ruling the sports landscape right about now, and that is baseball that's right they can't figure out the salaries they can't figure out the number of games our good friend Dave Hodge sent out a funny tweet on Wednesday he said if they play a 50 game season it'll take me about 50 games to get into the season so um, let's uh, uh, let's find out if Carl Ravitch got any um, new info from the MLB commission we're playing 48 games boys and let's get ready to go how will you feel if that's the end result of this I'll be disappointed that we're unable to reach an agreement that allows us to play more games. Um, but you know what? I think at the end of the day, the most important thing, and I'm not buying into your number of 48, the most important thing is that we play Major League Baseball in 2020, and I can tell you unequivocally, we are going to play Major League Baseball this year. Roger Federer is going to miss the rest of the 2020 season after having a second surgery performed on his right knee. The 20-time Grand Slam champ recently suffered a setback after his first operation four months ago. Federer hasn't played since January when he lost to Novak Djokovic in the semis at the Aussie Open. But Jay, I'm pretty sure that Federer, um, he'll be still be able to make rent because uh, he, he's okay in the <laughs> bank account. He's, he's almost got that uh, Molson-type money. Yeah, uh, well, you know, I don't know if Jeff Molson has a deal with Uniqlo, but I think Federer's deal with <laughs> Uniqlo is worth, well, basically all of the Molson family's net worth, basically. And Jeff oh, Molson, okay. who owns the Montreal Canadiens, uh, has been the subject of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of speculation, Dan, lately, because in a conference call Wednesday, he said he has no intention of hiring a president of hockey operations, saying that the club has full confidence in GM Mark Bergevin going forward. I still believe that we have an extremely exciting next few years ahead of us. Um, I believe that we have a great core group of veterans that are going to lead us through this. Um, we have some young players that are already on the team that we know are going to contribute. We've got some prospects coming that we are very hopeful on. And I still, the plan overall has been well executed despite um, some performance issues that we had uh, this season. We're on the cusp of having a really nice run for several years uh, with, a, with a team that's, that's playoff ready uh, every year and, and, and probably eventually we'll have a chance to, uh, to, to win our 25th Stanley Cup. Well, turning to the Canadian Football League, Dan, CFL players have been very vocal on social media on the issue of racial intolerance. And as the president of the CFLPA, 
Saskatchewan Rough Rider Solomon Elamimian has taken the recent events as a call to action. That's right, and we're hearing so many stories, uh, personal experiences uh, from players like Elamimian. Um, Farhan Lalji sat down with him, uh, well, virtually, the Al's Adrian Tracy and Ottawa's Nick Arbuckle to get their experiences and what they're going to do moving forward in the CFL roundtable. What conversations did you have with your parents about potentially having to deal with police? For me personally, uh, like make sure your hands are visible. <laughs> if you get pulled over in a car, make sure that you have your, your identification and everything already in a, a visible spot so they don't think that you're doing something to incite them to pull for their weapon. It's all about, you know, like agent says, carrying yourself in a way where, you know, like you have to maybe swallow your pride but over comply. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's one where you kind of learn the lessons from, from the streets. For me, I mean, I think my conversation that my parents had with me is kind of like the epitome of white privilege um, because I was told how to interact with police in order to avoid getting a ticket. Because if you were being polite enough and you were being really courteous and open and friendly, you might just get off with a warning. Time for Who Delivered, presented by McDelivery, June 10th, 97. The Royals' David Howard lined a ball to center field. It was destined to find the grass until Jimmy Edmonds chased it down. Spectacular over-the-shoulder diving grab. Jim Edmonds made at least 400 of these catches. Uh, Tim, why don't we have a Jim Edmonds top 10 since... Um, We've got all these top tens to run. That would be a stellar one. So I, I think, uh, as we point out our errors, uh, producer Tim blew it by not bringing us a Jim Edmonds top ten. I couldn't agree with you more, Dan. Jimmy Edmonds was one of my favorite players, just an incredible center fielder. And producer Tim, very short-sighted in, uh, in not thinking ahead and putting uh, this Jim Edmonds top ten together. Also, Jim Edmonds has been in the news a lot lately because he's going through a messy divorce, so... Uh, he probably wishes he was back. Well, wasn't uh, uh, he was back in the? Wasn't his field. wife on one of those? Uh, she was like one of the uh, Real Housewives. The Real Housewives of St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I so. No See ya. Thanks for watching. <laughs>